morning, everybody. This is uh, Scott Carson from NetTech Marketplace. Uh, today, I'm super excited to have Sarah Schickman on the podcast. And uh, uh, many of you uh, probably know her, um, and I'm guessing a fair amount of you have worked with her or, um, or uh, have heard about her. Uh, she is a lawyer and uh, a spa owner, or was a spa owner. Um, she currently has, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Clinton, uh, her uh, co-writer, uh, an Amazon bestseller book right now. It's number four on the Amazon uh, kind of uh, aesthetic dermatology bestseller bestseller list and uh, uh, called Med Spa Confidential. It's right here. I, I actually just finished the book this morning at about 4 a.m. Um, so uh, I'm ready to open a spa, Sarah. I'm ready to go. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to dive right in. And uh, um, uh, for those of you that uh, don't know, um, Sarah, she uh, started out um, um, uh, actually running a uh, e-commerce platform uh, after graduating uh, from law school, and uh, it didn't reference uh, Sarah where you went to school. It'd be great to hear a little more about where you went to school prior to starting out in furniture e-commerce. Sure, yeah. For undergrad, I went to Pace University, which is a primarily a business school in New York, and then I went to Penn for law school. And I graduated law school long ago in 2006, but you know, in this industry, we don't age. So, you know, um, take that for what it is. Um, and uh, uh, so you started out in uh, e-commerce and uh, had some great success there. And then uh, uh, you had a uh, kind of epiphany moment and decided to uh, be one of the early uh, uh, kind of uh, adopters of uh, uh, med spa and uh, Kind of started out there. I think it'd be interesting for people to understand the genesis of uh, of kind of where you uh, uh, you started. I, I was fascinated with your connection to uh, Larry Flint, and uh, there's such great info there. Um, if you want to share all that, I think that'd be fun to fun to hear. Sure. Yeah. So I um, was running a furniture e-commerce store, um, and we you know did millions in revenue, and it was quite successful and lots of employees and uh, i really learned my learned how to do online marketing through that um and then when i met my ex-husband he told me oh i want to start an aesthetics business where i'm going to be a botox doctor i was like botox you what like what is that um and where are you going to do that and he said well i just bought this uh building in in columbus ohio that um used to be owned by larry flint and so my my botox journey uh i think i was uh around 32 at that time, really began then um, in this old building in Columbus, Ohio, trying to build an aesthetics business, but not really knowing anything about aesthetics, um, zero, even less than zero, um, and just knowing how to market online. Uh, and uh, I, I just thought that was a great story about uh, how you ended up in uh, his, uh, his office and uh, kind of starting your business. And you know, um, I spent a lot of time um, talking about uh, uh, business lessons, which are a nice way of saying business failures. And one of the things that you touch on um, really in the introduction of uh, who you are and how this all came about is some of the early challenges um, associated with starting a med spa, especially in the very beginning when there wasn't any template and uh, you were really a pioneer um, in developing this. I think it'd be great to share uh, just with some of the people that are watching this or listening to it. Uh, some of the challenges that you faced um, when, when there really wasn't any template, any example, um, and there wasn't any roadmap, um, just some of the things you faced early on. Sure. I think um, one of the challenges we faced early on was how are we going to uh, really market this business? Uh, back then, um, people weren't really doing Instagram or Facebook, um, especially not advertising on those platforms. And when we would talk to people about, oh, we want to do Instagram ads, we're, we're posting on Instagram, the response we would get is, um, you know, that cheapens your brand, doctors don't do that, you know, look at all these big practices around town, they don't use Instagram. And, and we just said, okay, well, who cares? We're going to try it. Um, sometimes when you don't have a blueprint, it's kind of nice because you have you don't have to actually do it exactly the same way everybody else did. Um, so we kind of did a lot of experimenting. So that was a challenge. Another one was just staffing. I think in this industry, uh, the people are so important. Um, you know, coming from a totally different industry in law, for example, like uh, when I was an associate at a big firm in New York, 
I didn't matter as a person. I really didn't, you know. Um, they made me feel like I was totally replaceable every day. And mm -hmm. that's their model. And because they're paying so much money and because there's so many law uh, people graduating, they, they could do that. Even though I went to a top law school and I was a good performer, they were like, okay, Sarah, you're replaceable. You know, if you don't want to work here, have a great day. In a med spa, that was completely different. Um, you know, if, if I was to tell somebody that, okay, they would leave, I couldn't treat the patients. So, um, and the patients would follow the provider. And so a huge lesson for us was like having lots of staff people leave all the time and being stuck and just looking in the mirror and realizing, oh, oh these people left, not because of them, but they're actually leaving because of me. That's a great point. You know, I have a, it, it, one of the things I um, took notes on, since you brought up people, um, I want to, uh, I want to talk about this and this is not necessarily uh, related to the book or your experience, but it could be, is I have uh, uh, over my career read uh, well over a hundred business and strategy and finance books. Um, I'm, I'm self-taught and uh, both through trial and error and through education of, uh, of myself. And over the years, um, I found that many books um, really uh, said one thing, but the practical uh, or, or, or wrote one thing, uh, the writers wrote one thing, but the practical side of it really wasn't applicable. And one of those things was always put your employees first. And um, I found that, uh, uh, that that was important, but I found um, that really there's businesses out there that have really happy employees. And this has been especially true in SaaS and tech, where with unlimited PTO and free food and um, uh, great offices and high pay and equity, you can have really happy, happy employees, but miserable customers. And what I found over the years is if you have a static customers, it's impossible not to have uh, happy employees. So we focus on a static customer experience and mm -hmm. that directly um, uh, drives uh, ownership uh, and leadership to make sure that the employees are happy because you can't have static customers without uh, a static employee. So what are your thoughts on that as it relates to what you were just sharing? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think in aesthetics is especially true. Um, you know, customer retention is really important. Um, and if you don't have a great customer experience, then you really don't have a business in aesthetics. And then you have to have happy employees because if they're not happy, your customers will feel it. Um, and the whole customer experience will suffer. At the same time, if you're saying to your employees all day long, all that matters is the customer experience, what the employees are hearing is what you're saying, which is you don't matter. Mm -hmm. So you have to, I think in this business, the way you create a great customer experience is by having great employees and really um, having great incentive programs for them where they really feel like they're incentivized to do a great job. And mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there are legal ways to do it, which I help people with all the time, but there are also business ways to do it. So you don't, you know, a lot of people think like, okay, we're going to have a really strict contract. You know, that's the stick approach, right? Where it's going to be so strict, the non-compete. I mean, you know, if these people try to mess with me, you know, that's it. I'm going to ruin their life. That, that is okay, but that creates, that, that, that doesn't create happiness with employees. And then that translates to, a very bad customer experience. So I think it's much better to do the carrot approach where you treat people well, you have fair contracts with people, but at the same time, you create a culture where employees really are valued and you have you give them as much flexibility as you can. I understand this is a retail business, so you can't have unlimited PTO. You know, people would come to me and say, well, you know, in, at Google, you know, I heard we have unlimited PTO. My brother works at Google. Yeah, he has unlimited PTO, but it's completely different. He doesn't, you know, see customers uh, who come in and expect him to be there at 9 a.m. What, what will I tell my customer? Oh, the injector decided they are off this year to travel to Europe. That just can't work in this industry. <laughs> well, I think Elon uh, Musk, who we obviously all see every day um, and uh, applaud him for his uh, uh, almost hourly presence in my life. <laughs> recently came out and uh, made a really good point, which was, um, you know, all these companies that have unlimited PTO and don't work in an office, uh, which one of them actually delivers a great product and experience. 
it's actually a, a well um, a well stated thing. If you're in the business of creating great personal experiences and great products, it's very challenging to do that remotely. And uh, that's one of the things our business, our business is a very high touch um, uh, here in the facilities. And uh, uh, it'd, it'd be great if our technicians could work remotely. It's just not it's just not part of our industry. So I think I think people, if you're going to step into this space, have to know that. Um, you know, in the very beginning of the book, you say something, you and uh, Dr. Clinton uh, reference uh, um, that uh, starting a business like this is uh, like, I think you said, jumping off a skyscraper and building a jet on the way down. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it's like it takes a huge leap of faith. And at the same time, you have to be building something that's fast and scalable and can, you know, travel at high speeds. And, and it's and it's hard because a lot of people, you know, in, in my work now, I talk to a lot of nurses and a lot of PAs and a lot of business people who are just starting out. And, um, you know, they're coming from a hospital job or they're coming from the business world where they're used to, you know, a lot of predictability in terms of, okay, every Friday or every other Friday you get a paycheck, you are expected to, you know, complete 20 charts a day and do rounds and whatever else you need to do. Um, in this industry, it's not really like that. Starting this kind of business, you have to be extremely flexible and have to understand that maybe for the first year or two, you will likely make less money than you did when you were working for someone else. That's the truth. Um, mm -hmm. And you will likely have more ups and downs than if you were working for someone else. It is um, growing so rapidly and there are so many opportunities and that's amazing. But at the same time, there are tons of pitfalls. So it's, it's a great journey, but you really have to like jump in, you know, with both feet. I think starting it part-time is, uh, it's hard. And I think the chances of success are pretty small. You have to be really in it to win it and continue to innovate every single day. You know, I, I'm going to talk about this later on. I have some questions about uh, equipment, obviously, because that's really Star World um, quite a bit and uh, uh, the uh, sales reps. But I think what I find so fascinating on that point is this entire sales industry is selling hopes and dreams. Um, hey, if you buy this product, this device, it's going to free you up from the third party reimbursement gerbil wheel that you're on and you'll have to work less. And the uh, what you just stated, which I agree with, is you're actually going to work harder, much harder, and than you probably do working as an employee or working for the monopolized third-party reimbursement uh, model that currently exists today and in, in, uh, an insurance pay model. So I, I think you make a really good point. Your thoughts on that, because you know that's what they're being told every day. It's you're you're walking into this amazingly great opportunity if you just buy this two hundred thousand dollar device, and it's actually just the opposite. Yeah, I mean, devices don't sell treatments. The device is not going to teleport patients to your office, unfortunately. I wish it did. And, you know, sometimes we were told uh, when I was involved with the aesthetics clinics, we were told um, buy this device and from our patient locator or physician locator on our website, you're going to get a ton of leads. And we were like, okay, this sounds wonderful. Like how many? And they're like, well, like at least 10 or 20 a month. But we had Google Analytics tracking set up on our website and we we had our tracing set up on our phone calls too so we could see where the calls were coming and where the leads were coming and we would get zero from the website literally zero in six months we got zero leads for this particular device so you know i think um the machines don't really bring in clients i think your your marketing department brings in clients your customer experience brings in clients you bring in clients but the machine itself like all it does is brings a payment to you uh, and, uh, you know, it takes up a lot of space and in a few years could become obsolete. So I think machines are a very difficult thing in this business to get right. Um, and they're so incredibly expensive. I just, yeah, I can't, just cannot believe how expensive they are. Yeah, that's the, the you and I will probably do several podcasts over the next year. We'll have a separate one talking about the equipment industry you and I've touched on before, maybe having one on. Uh, equipment finance contracts, and uh, uh, so we'll dive into that. But I want to get back a little bit to uh, uh, to Dr. Clinton also getting back to kind of some fear. She had uh, an interesting start when she started out in this space that uh, provided some challenges, and it's referenced a little bit in the beginning 
where she talks about that right after she got going, she got diagnosed with uh, potentially terminal cancer. And that was one of the huge challenges that she faced getting started, but she overcame that as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, your co-writer, Dr. Clinton, and, and some of the struggles that she faced, which um, very few people ever face those kinds of challenges, but uh, she was able to overcome that through, really through perseverance and tenacity. Um, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, um, Dr. Clinton is a very strong woman and definitely an inspiration. And she's someone that when we were starting our business in Columbus, Ohio, um, I had heard of and her clinic was known as the, as the one where everyone has a great experience and somehow patients spend thousands of dollars um, and you know do a like full face rejuvenation type of treatments. Um, and I was like, wow, like this woman is a powerhouse. And then we, whenever people would leave our practice, they would say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna think about working for Dr. Clinton instead because you people are not nice and she's like <laughs> such a nice person and, and you guys are not. And I was like, whoa. Um, okay, I need to I need to get to know her and I need to find out more about her. And so, um, you know, as we were basically competitors in the same city, we got to know each other a little bit. Um, and then after Dr. Clinton sold her practice for, you know, a, a very good amount of money, um, I basically reached out to her and I said, listen, you go girl, but let's be friends now since, you know, you, you sold your practice. Like, tell me, you know, tell me about yourself and she said yeah you know i uh, you know i started my practice and at pretty much at the same time i found out I, I pretty much had terminal cancer um and i and for the last you know uh 15 plus years she's been uh battling it and and winning and at the same time running a practice you know being a mother uh being a trainer and and being a friend to so many people i mean she's like a community pillar in Columbus, Ohio. Every single person knows her and, you know, could tell you a great story about her. So, I mean, people do this, you know, with lots of challenges in their lives. You know, a lot of people call me and they say, oh, um, I just, my husband, I have, I did a consultation for somebody the other day and she said, oh, I have four kids. My, my husband just left me. I'm starting an aesthetics practice. Uh, and I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, that's amazing. Um, go, you know, go. Go, go, but also, you know, um, let me help you so yeah. that, you know, that, so that, you know, you make the right decisions. Cause she actually was like, well, I, you know, I think I'm going to buy these five machines. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, I was like, please, please not yet. But yeah, I think, uh, going back to, uh, Dr. Clinton, I, I, she's a wonderful person and I think everyone should, should get to know her. And it was fun being her competitor and also being inspired by her. Uh, it's it's such a um, uh, when I read that it's uh, really inspiring because all of us um, feel like you know we're dealing with the most critical challenge every day you know massive forest fires and I don't think people really appreciate the amount of forest fires that are coming our way in a current recessionary environment I think this industry is is pretty well isolated but for the same time uh, at the same time I say that it's going to be a challenge for the next couple of years but you know she is an inspiration because. It, it, no matter what most of us are ever dealing with, we're not uh, dealing with what she did. And, and so what a great uh, testament to people starting out in this industry to realize if Dr. Clinton can overcome that and persevere, persevere and then ultimately have the great success and then uh, now create a book that's a uh, kind of a, a mini textbook for people to have success in this industry. It was real, uh, really great for me to see. One of the things that you just touched on um, that, that I want to make a point on, and I pretty much talk about it all the time, and it's really a contrarian position, Sarah, it, it, from someone like myself, is I literally have doctors, and I mean literally at least once a day, sometimes multiple times a day, calling me up, and the first thing out of their mouth is, Scott, I'm calling you up. Here you have a great company. You're a great person, and I would like to buy five machines. And I'm like, you do not want to buy five machines. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure you should buy any. And uh, we need to slow down and see what you're doing. Like, no, no, Scott, you don't understand. I'm going to do, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy that. And it's going to do this. And, and I always say this, I say, there's a thousand pre-owned devices in our facility right now that we own. And a hundred percent of them came from failure. Nobody ever sells us a device that came from success. If they're making money with it, they keep it. <laughs> and even if it's old, they keep it as a backup, but nobody sells the things that are doing well. And so you have to think about that, how many devices we have, which isn't even a scratch on the surface of the 
hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially billions of dollars of assets that are sitting in the corner that were bought that aren't utilized. So, um, and this really goes to one of the chapters in your book about starting small. And I am a huge believer that in everything that you need to really um, get out there, put your toes in the water and go slow. Can you talk about what you and Dr. Clinton uh, reference um, or what you mean by starting starting small? Yeah, I think uh, you have to start with a really, um, the minimum amount invested possible so that you could really control what's going to happen and that you don't get yourself in trouble. So maybe that's 50,000 or maybe that's 25,000 or maybe that's 100,000 for everything. So when you're starting thinking about, okay, do I really need a whole big space that's built out? Like, how do I know how many rooms I'm gonna need in a year? So how am I gonna sign, or five years, how am I gonna sign a five-year lease on day one? Maybe it's better to start in a medical co-working space or renting a room from somebody else. When you start, you wanna be known for something, right? Like there are all these blowout bars or um, different clothing brands that only sell like very particular things. It's much better to do that than to try to be a Walmart or Costco. It is very expensive to keep a lot of inventory on hand. It takes up space, but it also takes up cash and it takes up mental space. So much better to say, when I start, I'm gonna offer three services. Maybe they're gonna be Botox, fillers, and laser hair removal, or Botox, microneedling, and um, I don't know, spray tanning, whatever it is. I would say like keeping your menu very narrow is so much easier than trying to be everything to everybody. In the beginning, what you can do is you have your narrow menu, and then if somebody um, wants something that you don't have, you, you establish a relationship with another practice and you say, okay, if you guys want this, I'm going to refer patients to you for this. And then, you know, in, in exchange, you guys will do something nice for me as well. You know, you could legally structure some kind of arrangement that works for you where you don't have to buy a thousand machines at once because it's just so expensive and you just don't know on day one what to get. So I would just slow down and it's like, are you going to get married before going on, I don't know, 25 dates? No. So don't do that in your business. You know, it's it, it, it's a common conversation I have, and I ha I say it a little bit differently, is, um, but I think it's along the, it's the same theme, which is um, customers will call us up. There's a lot of emerging dermatologists, plastics, and med spas, and um, they'll uh, they'll say, again, they'll start, we're going to buy a lot of equipment, or we're going to open this up. And I say, God, you, you again, go small. I, and it sounds so unusual for somebody in the business of selling things that we want them to go small. And why we take that position is, is if they're successful with one thing and they're making money and doing well, they're going to come back and buy more things. If they buy one or two things they're not successful with, then they're not going to come back um, because they're either out of business or they're going to have a bad experience on the device that we sold them. So um, one of the things I tell them is, is I always find this kind of fascinating is no one in the space seems to have actually done any research on the market. They just open a med spa. And I always say, God, if I were opening up a restaurant, which I know very little about, I would go eat at all the restaurants. I would see how they greet me. I would call them up and see how they answer the phone. I would, um, uh, you know, see what their hours are. I would uh, uh, taste various things. I would take different guests. I would I would really see how they're positioned before I even thought about my location or my menu or how I'm going to staff it. And in this space, I'll say, well, what kind of phantom shopping did you do? What kind of, you know, did you actually go and experience anything? Did you find out what people are offering? You know, what are their lost leaders? And you would think, uh, Sarah, I'm speaking Greek. They're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, how, how do you even know what to do? So in this case, it really drives what you just said is start small because the competition, this is a big thing, competition and patience have a funny way of guiding, and I mean this kind of as a joke, your business more than you. You can be the smartest and most well-prepared business person out there, but the competition and patience in this industry are going to really drive what your success is. What are your thoughts? Yeah, on that? yeah definitely. I agree. Um, I think a lot of clients don't secret shop their com competitors, and I think that's a mistake. Um, we actually work with a couple of marketing companies 
who do this kind of service for them. Like one is Akara, but there are a couple of others. And basically they do a business analysis and they will do the secret shopping for medical spas. And it's super valuable. I think, um, you know, somebody goes and goes to all the places in the neighborhood and fills out basically a sheet of how do they greet clients? How much does this cost? What's their process? There's nothing wrong with doing that. You can even, you know, have your friend or family member do it. But we used to do that a lot. Um, at our practice, we would go to all the places in, in Columbus, Ohio, and um, have friends going there, have them do treatments and, and, you know, have them take detailed accounts of what, exactly what happened. And there's no substitute for that. And mm -hmm. one cool way to do that that I always tell our clients is you can actually go to BotoxCosmetic.com, mm -hmm. then find the practice locator, put in your zip code, and right there will show you all the practices by volume that are the biggest in your neighborhood. That's how you know who is your competition. Mm -hmm. And then now to go down that list to the top 10 and then get a little treatment, the same one at each place. So maybe have, you know, a couple of friends help you. And then you could compare side by side exactly how, what their sales process is, how they treat their clients, you know, were they on time, how long it took, all that stuff. So yeah, I think studying the competition in any business is extremely important. Um, great point. Getting back to people for a minute um, and staffing, um, one of the things that I wanted to touch on um, that uh, um, we were talking about people, and since we're bouncing around, it uh, uh, didn't occur to me till uh, till now, is um, uh, there's a chapter in your book about paying people. And I want to uh, um, just kind of walk people into my experience. I have clinicians that call me and they'll say, Scott, my staff just left because I wouldn't give them another $2 an hour. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, why not give them three? And they're like, you don't understand, it's $3. And, and I'm like, who cares? <laughs> like, what is the big deal? Pay the $3. And do you have any idea what you're gonna lose in disruption of not having that person, what you're gonna lose and what's gonna cost you to replace that person, the loss of patience they're gonna take with you? Um, it just makes no sense to me that this turnover is is being created, even if they have great experiences um, for their customers and for their employees, they're underpaying them to the market that's currently getting very competitive. And your thoughts on that, because the chapter is about paying people well, and it touches on a lot of topics, one of them being those. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's one of the most critical things in the industry today. I think that... Um, it's super competitive, right? And because of the new changes in laws, in many states, nurse practitioners can open up their own medical spas. Business people can open up management companies that run medical spas from the business side. RNs can open up their own medical spas by doing this management company structure. So basically, if you don't treat your employees well, not only can they leave to your com competition, they will also create a bad customer experience for you, and they could open up their own practice. So that's kind of one side of it. The other side of it is it doesn't cost that much more to pay people well. In terms of your bottom line, you know, in this business, a typical net income, I think, is somewhere between 15 and 25%. So, okay, for you, it, it will go out of your net income. So you will go from your 25% to 22 or 23 in that way. But in the customer retention way and in the cost for you to have a recruiter, uh, do more marketing, talk, have empty schedules. The cost of that is way higher than that two or three percent that you were going to pay. So it's all about the bottom line, and I think for the bottom line, it makes sense to treat your people well. And for the for having like a normal work life balance and a healthy life, and to feel good about yourself in the morning. I, when I was in a position not to treat people well and where we didn't pay people as much as we should have, it's a terrible feeling because I know what I'm doing is wrong. And I know that it's just a matter of time until the people leave. Why would you create that kind of life for anybody else or for yourself? It's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, there, there is really in business, it distills down to two things. Do you have great customer experiences and are you making money? Those are the two measuring points that matter the most. And, um, you're right. I, I couldn't agree more. If you're making, 
you know, 15, 20, 22%. The difference between that 1% um, is causing you more pain and harm uh, trying to hang on to those uh, uh, tiny dollars. So uh, that's a great point and I think a uh, great reference. You know, one of the things that you've touched on a lot, um, uh, you know, for the uh, first half of the discussion is that you did some things wrong in the beginning. And one of the things that I find refreshing is you seem to own that. Like you really own that I did not treat people well. I made some critical mistakes, but I made enough successes that I was able to keep going. Um, I imagine now that um, uh, your practice is uh, is dealing with a lot of crisis and uh, uh, cleaning up messes and uh, kind of preparing people to keep out of those messes. Can you talk about um, you know, what your current day looks like as a lawyer um, in the aesthetic uh, arena. Yeah, so um, about half of the day is helping people deal with crises. And most of the crises are either um, somebody leaving and competing and putting an end to that, or a nursing board or medical board or pharmacy board coming in for a surprise visit to a practice. And that's about, you know, I would say half of my day. The other half of my day is helping people structure their new practices correctly. So we get a lot of calls for new people entering the market who want to open a practice. And so I help them decide, okay, should you have investors? How do you need an MSO? Um, what's a good location to start your practice in? Um, legally, what entities do you need to set up and what protocols do you need to have in place? So my day is kind of broken into the, the urgent and the fun. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, you talk about um, uh, crisis um, uh, that uh, people call up in panic mode. Um, I have this philosophy that time is usually your ally, um, and pretty much time takes care of a lot of this stuff. How many of those crises um, are are so severe that they uh, can't be overcome uh, as a percentage? Can you make an estimate on that? Uh, very few. I think most of the crises is with time and with lawyers and with the proper change in procedures could be overcome in this industry. Um, I would say 90, I don't know, 98% probably. Um, I'm not saying they can be overcome in, in an hour uh, or that you won't lose sleep about it, but they can be overcome. They're expensive to overcome because correction is so much more expensive in this, in in this industry than prevention. In, in many different ways, you know, it, it's the same with wrinkles. It's much better, I think, I mean, I'm not a medical professional, but in my opinion, I'm so happy. I started doing Botox at age 32. Mm -hmm. At age 40 now, you know, it would just be different. Um, and the same thing with like legal compliance. It's so much better just to have your yourself structured correctly from the beginning than to wait for that inevitable visit from a nursing board and then restructure everything. Because you're gonna end up paying way more legal fees if, for example, you don't have anybody on site doing good faith exams, like mm -hmm. it's just some very basic things. It costs just a little more money to have a nurse practitioner than an RN, but it's just better to, to do that from the beginning. Otherwise, um, it's very expensive having lawyers explain to the board why you did not have you know, a prescriber and why all these people got drugs without being seen by a, you know, someone who was supposed to see them first. So it, it's, it sounds like just the way you're describing this, and I, it is in the very beginning of this industry, it was the Wild West, that there wasn't a lot of regulatory, there wasn't a lot of oversight. And now um, I know this, and it sure seems like you've uh, um, uh, confirmed that there is a lot of regulation and oversight and governance. And if you're going to be in this space treating patients, especially with um, you know, toxins and energy-based devices, you need to really have everything buttoned up in the beginning, or you're exposing yourself and your family uh, and your business to great risk. Yeah. Yeah. I think as you become successful in this business, and many people do, you, your competitors say, oh, wow, look, this other med spa is, is more successful than us. Let's see, let's see if we could get the board to come in and investigate them. And they file an anonymous complaint. The whole anonymous complaint procedure in this industry is kind of what fuels all the regulatory stuff um, because anyone can file an anonymous complaint on anyone. So these complaints come up. So inevitably somebody complains 
and then you get a visitor and you know it's just not um it's never pleasant and your staff sees it and so it's not good for morale it's not good for how they see your practice your customers may see may see it so yeah i think the industry is becoming a little bit more regulated uh, but at the same time, it's also becoming a little bit more um, open to non-physicians and non-core physicians. So when I first started here, um, it used to be that if you're not a plastic board certified plastic surgeon or dermatologist, you weren't even taking, taken seriously, both by the drug companies and by clients. But now there's, there's a big change in regulations uh, where nurse practitioners in many states have full practice authority, for example. And also clients are seeing on Instagram and through marketing that it doesn't have to be doctors, just doctors doing the procedures. And because of that, the floodgates of uh, providers have opened, you know, everyone, pretty much everyone is, is who can is starting this kind of business. And so because of that, um, necessarily there are some bad players too entering the market. And because of, of a few bad players, Sometimes there's more regulation because things do go wrong sometimes. Um, again, great, uh, great point. I'm curious, um, it, it just, it, and maybe you can't answer it, but what would be the cost if um, I called you up and said, hey, Sarah, I'm getting ready to open up a med spa and uh, um, I want to get started uh, here in Park City and and uh, you know, I've never really done it before, kind of like that uh, uh, you had a, a phone call recently. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, before you got started, somebody uh, jumping into the space. Can you um, uh, give me an idea of what a cost would be to properly structure, uh, an, you know, an organization the right way? I'm just curious what that would be. And maybe you can't answer it, but I think it, if you can, that'd be great for people to understand. Because my guess is it's not hugely expensive. No, it's not hugely expensive. And as a huge believer in pricing transparency, I'm super happy to answer that question, actually. Um, so typically to open a new medical spa in terms of legal costs, um, for us to do it is about $5,000. That's that's the typical amount. If they're partners or if there's a more complicated structure, it could be closer to 10, but somewhere more likely closer to five, but somewhere between five and 10. So that's five to 10,000 in probably a budget of, 50 to 200,000, which is the typical budget we hear when people are opening a spa. So it's it's not $100, but also it's not 25,000. It's I think it's certainly doable. Much much less than uh, than I uh, I thought. Um, I was thinking 25 to 50, but to, it seems very affordable. And why I think that's why it's striking me as so odd to not do it right is because I, these these um, sales reps, um, uh, what I really find fascinating about this industry uh, and sales reps is the people selling the devices are giving business advice. And 99.9% .9 of the time, those people have never owned a business. And they're giving, the sales reps are giving guidance on how successful they're going to be. And they're selling these, as I mentioned earlier, hopes and dreams. And people are spending a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand or more on equipment. Yet the idea they're going to spend a thousand dollars on a smoke evacuator um, seems shocking to them. Or five thousand to set up the corporation the right way, um, they wouldn't even consider it. And I really find that their thinking is backwards. Uh, safety precaution structure is the most important thing before you enter the space. And I assume you feel the same way. Yeah, I mean. Safety doesn't give you money, right? Safety doesn't come in and say, well, you know, you, you're going to ha have this hood and because of this hood, you're going to make $100,000. But um, having the safety in place gives you comfort and peace of mind and makes you pretty much immune if something goes wrong in terms of, you know, your competitor reporting you for something that isn't true. So I think, yeah, a lot of times reps do come in and they say, well, Okay, you're an esthetician. Yeah, you can run this laser here. Yeah, it's fine. I, you know, everybody's doing it. Um, so it's very important to really check with your lawyers to make sure that when reps tell you that a certain type of licensure is enough to perform a certain type of treatment, that you actually check with lawyers. Um, sometimes the reps are right, but also they are not allowed to give you legal advice, and and oftentimes it's not correct. And they're not going to protect you if somebody comes in and, and says, 
what you know the first thing that usually happens in a malpractice lawsuit is um they say okay the person who was doing this were they licensed and authorized to perform this per the law and the second question is okay were they were they authorized to perform this per the practice mm -hmm. so um did the practice make them violate the law or did they violate the law on their own and so the practice can't then go back and say well the laser rep told me that this is okay that that that's irrelevant what's mm -hmm. relevant is what was the law and what did you allow your provider to do so it's just really important before buying something just to check with the law um i know sometimes it costs a little bit of money but i i firmly believe that uh that will save you way more money and way more heartache in the end i'm gonna uh switch to uh uh maybe just as we kind of wrap things up kind of talk about uh, success let's end on a happy kind of a happy positive note um the guys at laser away have had great success you referenced them in the beginning of the book and uh, uh is an example of doing well and um <clears throat> and so i think what I, you know you've you've had the perspective or your unique perspective of uh, uh seeing some of the challenges and crises and and panics uh, on a day-to-day -day basis but you're also seeing the great successes and you referenced dr clinton earlier and as i mentioned laser away um one of the points i'll make on laser away is this is uh, there's this belief that you have to have the best and newest equipment um, all the time to be competitive. Interestingly, one of the things that separates LaserWay from everyone else is they buy really good equipment, a lot of it used, they service it themselves, they have a very much a Southwest Airlines type model of having consistency across the practice to minimize service costs. And so I think there's this perception that I always have to have the best, newest things, and yet one of the big, biggest success we've seen recently that you referenced LaserWay in selling uh, half of their business or just under half of their business for a massive amount of money is the fact they were running it like a business very efficiently. So can you talk about some of the successes that you've seen and how it ties to running businesses efficiently? Yeah, and LaserWay, you know, multiple times in their journey almost went out of business too. So they had a lot of ups and downs themselves as well. And um yeah, I, I know for a fact they also buy a lot of their equipment used. And but what they do really well is um, they do a lot of research and they are really experts in the equipment that they get. And they don't fall for the oh, this is this new thing. They say to themselves, okay, we have I don't know eighty plus locations. We are going to have exactly the same equipment and exactly the same processes at every single location, mm -hmm. and that gives them tremendous economies of scale and they can grow exponentially that way. Um, when I have clients who say, oh, I have six locations in this location, I have this, and in this location, this is part-time, and then I move this to here, and my person, and you know, here we do this, and there we do, and I'm like, whoa, like, that, that is not a scalable business. We can't, you, we can't really um, help you scale it. We have to pick first how you wanna scale it because also, when you when it goes to selling your business or getting investors, there's lots of private equity money in this in this industry right now, and people looking to buy practices and scale up and make them into you know 20, 30 locations. You have to be doing the same thing at every location, and you have to have the same equipment at every location. I know that's a little bit boring, but um, even the the most successful practice in this country, which I think is Laser Away, um, does it this way, and they don't fall for the latest bells and whistles. There's so much money to be made. Just having the sta more standard lasers that just do, you know, hair removal and um, sunspots and, and, you know, the basic things, not the super fancy, you know, neck tightening or something like that, that could be great for one practice or one of your locations, but before making a huge investment, you really should think about it. I don't know if that was positive enough though. We, I feel like we could do more positive. <laughs> no, I, I, I think if if you're um, in this business, um, uh, if you're gonna if you're in this business or you're going to start in this business, uh, as I said earlier, the positive is great customer experiences and making money. And so, touching on kind of you know some of the tips and tricks. Uh, of laser away, um, I think is important. And I think it is in positive. As we wrap things up, if uh, uh, I think uh, two things, one is 
just a couple of more kind of tips to that uh, somebody starting out or jumping into the space or if they're already in the space, just a couple things top of head that uh, are interesting to you. And then it'd be great if you could tell people how to get a hold of you, um, because uh, I'm guessing that uh, my audience and uh, uh, the people that uh, will see this over the next uh, weeks, months and years will want to be able to get a hold of you for crisis management or putting themselves in a better position to start or restructuring their business. So a couple of tips and uh, and maybe just tell us all how we can get a hold of you. Yeah, um, I think my number one tip would be to have really good contracts with your team members, your partners, your um, clients who I also consider your team members and your employees. So making sure that your clients understand what is your refund policy? What happens if they buy a treatment and they never use it? Uh, what happens if they buy a treatment and maybe they're not 100% happy? And with your, with your team members, what happens if they want to take unpaid vacation or um, they want to change their schedule? Just really having those things in writing, I think, really helps. So that would be my number one tip. And in terms of getting in touch with me, the best way I think is for my law firm's website, which is www.lingialaw.com and on Instagram, Lingia Law. That's the two main ways people get in touch with me. And we always love hearing from people and answering questions and just helping people do the right thing in this industry. And I love helping people make their businesses grow. Nothing makes me happier. I think it's amazing the amount of growth this industry has had and will have. Recession, no recession. I think it's pretty recession proof. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just look forward to continuing to help people. And I'm so honored that you invited me to be on this podcast, Scott. Well, Sarah, thank you. Everybody, you got to buy this book. Okay. <laughs> um, and just so people uh, know, I actually did read it. I did take notes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I feel like uh, uh, I learned a tremendous amount. And um, uh, I... Uh, I'm now considering when we talk to throughout the day, uh, Sarah, I'm going to send, start sending these books to customers that are starting out because our fundamental position is if they're successful with one thing, even if it's not an energy based device, even if it's just something simple like a microneedling pen, uh, something simple, or even if they're going to start in injectables that has nothing to do with what we do, or maybe just PRP and they're, they're starting out with a centrifuge from us. Uh, we want them to have the best foundational tools and, um, uh, I'll kind of close with this is uh, uh, customers will call me up and, and they'll have a lot of equipment and uh, they'll say, uh, 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 Scott, I, I'm thinking about buying this, this great new thing and I think it's going to change my practice. And I'll say to them, you know, maybe what you should do is uh, teach your staff how to answer the phone. And they look at me like, what is this guy understand? I want to buy this piece of equipment. And I said, the equipment's not going to help you. So my point is, buy the book. It's going to tell you uh, how to save yourself a lot of headache, a lot of misery and uh, be successful. So Sarah, thank you for, uh, for joining. It's been great. And I uh, uh, appreciate you very much coming on. Thanks so much, Scott. Have a good rest of your day.